Um, we can start. I'll start by introduce, introducing me and GCNR and then our speaker. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session. I'm Ella He, a fifth year, just finished fifth year as a medical student, and I'm one of the ambassadors of GCMER Bulgaria. Uh, our um, events head, Judith, couldn't make it tonight, but yeah. Um, I'd like to introduce today's presenter. He has been GCMER Bulgaria's guest many times previously. He is an intern physician at Georgi Stransky Hospital in Pleven, Bulgaria. He's a council member of the Association of Medical Students of Bulgaria and also a member of the group on public health and policy with the European Student Think Tank. He is very interested in research and has publications in various fields. He's currently working on multicenter trials in oncosurgery. And the purpose of this event is to discuss administration and leadership in research projects. Um, Mr. Aparjaya Shankar, you can proceed with the talk and whenever you are ready. So, <clears throat> Eli, thank you very much for that very warm welcome. And uh, I would like to thank everybody present here as well for attending. You know, uh, these kinds of talks don't work without an audience. And uh, I'm always very thankful whenever uh, people um, give me their time, which is often the most valuable thing you can give to anyone, right? So with that said, I'm going to just start sharing my screen and uh, and let's hope that you can see it. Yes. Okay. Um, I hope you can see my screen and there is no obstruction in the way. Um, no gray bars or, yeah. Okay. So administration and leadership in research projects. So now at the outset, I want to make uh, something very, very clear. Uh, this is not a lecture and i am one of those people who doesn't believe in the idea that uh in the idea that you can teach leadership to somebody you know um, leadership is not one of those things that is uh you know it's not a it's not a topic of uh academic uh research as much as it should be and at the same time you know research is uh administration and leadership are not things that uh that you can't learn you can learn them right uh, and leadership is actually born a lot out of experience. Um, one of my core beliefs has always been that uh, leadership uh, in and of itself uh, is something that people can aspire towards with a reasonable expectation that yes, you can be a leader one day. Now, with that said, let's uh, you know talk a little bit more about myself um, as if we haven't done that already, but um, so I have four years of research experience and uh, I, I have seven uh, peer-reviewed publications, um, and I have supervised five research projects. I'm currently supervising another few more. Um, I think at latest count, it must be around seven or eight, something in the middle of those two numbers. Um, I have attended um, six uh, conferences as an active participant. I've been invited to three conferences as a uh, keynote speaker. And I have, of course, surgical and uh, medical experience as well. and, and uh, I also have a lot of research experience, as you can see from the screen. Uh, but uh, this uh, this talk is not entirely about me. Um, you know, we, I'm not going to be uh, going too uh, too deep onto the idea of myself. Uh, but I am only going to use my experiences as, as a sort of um, as a scaffolding around which we can discuss leadership in general. Now, my experiences with leadership uh, began very early as well. Uh, so, for example, when I was a school kid, um, I was uh, a member of the National Credit Corps of India. Uh, I was with the uh, 5th Bengal Battalion, the 301st Company. And uh, I was a sergeant when I was around 15 years old. And I was also uh, the captain of the debate team and captain of the uh, Department of Audiovisual and Technical Support at my, uh, at my school. And in those positions, uh, I was one of the youngest sergeants in the uh, in the company at the time. Uh, I was also one of the youngest uh, captains of the debate team as well. And these were things that um, that in and of themselves are not really much, right? Uh, but they gave me a very good uh, they gave me a very deep foundation on you know research and leadership uh, together. And I'll tell you why. Now, most of the time when we talk about uh, you know, leadership, what ends up happening is that you close your eyes and you look at a leader as somebody who's really fierce, 
Um, you talk about, uh, you know, military leaders, you talk about presidents, you talk about a football uh, team captain. So these things are not always what leaders are. Those are just the manifestations of certain types of leaders, right? And one thing I do want to say is that in my experience, you know, leadership in medicine uh, and education and so on and so forth, these are not hierarchical things, right? And so you have to get out of the mindset of this overt militarization of the world as it is, you know, like uh, when we think about COVID, we were, dis we were describing people as frontline warriors, right? Uh, we were talking about the battle against COVID, you know, the war on drugs or the war on cancer. And these militarized terms are very, they're very good at galvanizing the population, right? They, there is nothing more uh, romantic than thinking about ourselves as warriors, you know, or thinking of ourselves as some kind of bastion of strength. But medicine is not always about war, actually. Um, and, and when wars do happen, as they are happening now, uh, you can see quite clearly why these militaristic uh, and frankly, very jingoistic terms don't always work. So I want to begin first by trying to reiterate three points. Um, so the first thing is that leadership and research projects uh, should not be hierarchical. You know, if you are a research uh, leader or you are in charge of a research team, uh, you're not the owner of all of the people who are below you. You're not a military captain. You don't have to have these hierarchical things that, okay, just because somebody is doing a different role than you are, um, they need to listen to everything you say. And it goes both ways, right? And I have always attempted that, you know, there should be more democratization in, in research and in medicine. And one of the biggest challenges that we face is that a lot of times, research teams end up becoming very hierarchical simply because there are two modes of, uh, there are two domains under which leadership exists in medicine. So the first is based on experience. So the first thing about experience would be that, okay, uh, you know, um, somebody who's a PhD and has like 30 years of experience on a certain topic is most likely going to be the, the leader of a research project. And the other thing also is that it's also based on expertise. So if I have say eight postgraduate degrees, you know, I have an MSc, an MA, I have an MPhil degree, then a PhD and a DSC, then it is more likely that what I say is going to be more valuable, even if what I say is wrong, right? And it gives into this idea of uh, an inherent bias when we perceive who should be in charge of what. Now, the second thing in leadership in research is this important point in the middle, which is that, you know, you are trying to aim towards the success of the research project, not the success of data or not the success of a hypothesis. You are investigating. You are an investigator at the end of the day. Uh, any research scientist or a clinical researcher, uh, we are investigators at the end of the day. We don't have, we are not lawyers, right? And that is another thing that we need to sort of uh, emphasize on. Your hypothesis is not supposed to be successful or not successful. You're supposed to study and test the hypothesis. Now, testing the hypothesis is very different um, from trying to prove the success of the hypothesis, right? And whenever you are part of any research team, uh, no matter what your role is, you have to emphasize on trying to ensure that the research project was done with, with proper principles and an adherence to scientific fact, right? And the third most important thing is that leaders are made, they're not born. Yeah, there is this uh, idea of the born leader, which is a fallacy, in my opinion. Um, nobody's born with leadership skills right out of the basket. Um, you're also not born with certain qualities that make you a better researcher. These are things that are skills which are learned throughout time. So, and of course, uh, whenever you talk about a journey, which is like learning something, you know, learning medicine, for example, is a journey. Um, specializing in something is a journey you always are going to begin from a position where you don't know much. If you knew everything right out of the bat, then you know there would be no point in learning and there is no one in the world who knows everything, right? So with that said, let, uh, let's keep these three points in mind. And I am going to now, uh, I am now going to share with you a, a link and I want all of your opinions. And so the first is, uh, I am going to just share this link with you. This is also another question that I will have. And now I want to judge everybody's perception on what they think um, makes a good leader, right? So I'm going to uh, share this in the chat now. Uh, and I want all of you to click on this link and, you know, give me your answers. What qualities make a good leader? 
And I want to try, I want you to limit yourselves to just two or three words. Uh, I don't want a long thesis. It's not going to fit on the screen. And uh, much as I value your opinion, uh, we can discuss, you know, theories of leadership afterwards. But right now, I want all of you to just uh, sort of fill out in what, in your opinion or in your experience, what makes a good leader. We have something about leadership. Okay, let's go ahead. Okay, very nice. Okay, we have some responses. Let's go ahead and see if we can get some more. Okay. Okay, we have some good, <clears throat> we have some good responses. All right, some more responses are coming in. All right, I'm going to leave this open for a few more seconds. Okay, so now I'm going to log this uh, for the minute. And uh, I want all of you to look at the few words here. That a leader is flexible, they are responsible, they are understanding, uh, they are kindness, they are kind, you know, they are, uh, they have good communication skills, you know, they're efficient. So remember that, uh, you know, look, look at this constellation of words that are on your screen right now, and you will realize that there are no hard and fast rules to becoming a good leader, right? And everybody's perception on what is a good leader differs. So if you want to be a leader in a research project, you have to ask yourself as to what you want out of the project, right? And what you want out of the experience of research, right? So let's go back. Um, let's go back to my presentation here. and. Let's just take a look for a minute at what roles exist in uh, the roles that exist in a research project. So the first is the principal investigator. Uh, the principal investigator is the person who is responsible for the study design. Uh, they will also write out a protocol and they are most likely the most expert, uh, like they're the most experienced people on the team, right? They're the senior most in terms of any academic hierarchies that exist. Uh, they could be professors or they could be the, you know, the chair of some research unit or the head of the research association of the university or head of a laboratory. And then after that, you have the research supervisor. So in my experience as well, I've been working as a resource supervisor for um, a little over a year and I have overseen uh, on six or seven projects and I'm currently in charge of a few of them as well. And what my role and the role of any resource supervisor is to ensure that the members of the team are supervised well, that they're doing the job that they're supposed to, right? They are, you know, um, they're organized in a manner that is efficient for the whole team. And I will also be, I also help them with the workflow itself. So for example, if there are questions about a certain type of data that I need to collect and they are not understanding something, then they come to me first, right? After that, we have data collectors, you know, who collect the data. It could be anything from patient history, from laboratory analysis and uh, so on and so forth. Then the data validator, a data validator is somebody who validates the data collected and ensures that the data collected is actually of good quality and that it complies with the and it complies with the uh, with the protocol of the study. And then you have reviewers and methodologists. So a reviewer is somebody who does the background literature review and also reviews the entire data collection process, make sure that the data validator and the principal investigator um, are interpreting the data in a manner that is correct, that is scientifically valid. And the methodologist and the statistician analyzes the data. So, you know, if you imagine this as a pipeline, the data collector collects the data, the data validator ensures that the collected data is correct. And, you know, the reviewers and the methodologists will analyze and synthesize the data, right? So most of the time, most students, uh, depending on where they are in the world, uh, begin either as data collectors, right? or as data validators, right? And I, unfortunately, I didn't start as a data collector or a data validator. I worked in a different research project where I was a reviewer. And in one of the, uh, in one of our studies, uh, one of the studies that I did, I was a methodologist. So my job as a methodologist was essentially that I needed to choose the best methodology for a paper, right? 
Then eventually I moved on to being both a data collector and a research supervisor because in a lot of times what does happen is that we need to have experience with collecting data properly. And then that sort of helps with supervising the research project. Okay. But if you look at this uh, slide in front of you, uh, if you remove any one component from this slide, you will realize that uh, the research team is going to be underfunded and is, is going to be under strength. And the reason for that is that all of these people, uh, all of these different roles in a research team are essential for its success. So you have to understand before you go any further in medical research that every member of the team actually does make a difference, right? And not only do they not, not just make a difference, they're essential to the success of the study. So these are some essential starting points that um, all of you should know. And the first is that you need to be able to organize yourself and other people. And that means organizing time, organizing your schedules, organizing uh, research activities, you know, supervising anyone uh, who needs help with uh, their role within the team. The second is that you need to understand the project, its aims and its objectives. So you need to be very familiar with the research protocol, the hypothesis that is being tested, and you need to be able to understand what the purpose of the project is. Why is a project being done? And the third is resolving conflicts. Now I, will, I have dedicated a section for conflict resolution for the simple reason that conflict resolution is a skill that you need as a doctor either way. Um, you know, even if you're not going to go into research further um, and you are going to just work as a doctor, remember that you, you need, there is a skill to resolving conflicts with other people. It's not just that, you know, you, uh, you try to, you know, talk them down or try to, you know, display empathy. You know, sometimes it's not always possible to display empathy to at a person who is trying to constantly, you know, get on your nerves, right? And so resolving conflicts requires a systematic approach. And I am going to try to tell you how to do it. Um, and uh, we'll see if that is helpful to you or not, right? And let's see what administration and research looks like. So when you are administering a research project, remember that you are in charge of the day-to-day, -day, right? And so for an example, let's take a very small research project, the smallest one that's a literature review, right? Now literature review can be done by three or four people, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is easier than others. Um, in my previous talk, I had uh, spoken about the escalator of complexity. And so the escalator of complexity was my own framework in which I try to help people decide the kind of research pro projects that they can reasonably do, right? And it takes into account different factors like, you know, your own skills, the availability of data, whether you have infrastructure support or not. But let's assume that you have the perfect uh, situation. You know, you have appropriate numbers of team members, you have good expertise, you have good opportunities, you have good data, you have the infrastructure for full support. Now we'll go into the next step, which is the administration of this research project. So your principal investigator or your professor comes up with an idea and they write a whole protocol that, okay, today we are going to examine the rates of uh, wound infections in patients who've undergone, uh, say, uh, right hemicolectomy, right? Now you have the basic understanding that this is the protocol. All of our patients should be adults. They should have had uh, like surgical intervention on the abdomen. And we just need to see how many of them ended up developing a surgical site infection, right? And you have recruited maybe uh, seven or 10 people to help you. Now, administration in research in general uh, focuses on, a on these five things that are present on your screen right now. So the first is patient safety, that you must understand that at all stages, patient state safety comes first. All research projects have to be ethical. They need to adhe adhere to certain standards of ethics that are non-negotiable, right? And the second, <clears throat> compliance with the protocol. So if the protocol tells you that you have to take patients who have only undergone a right hemicolectomy, um, you have to instruct your data collectors that, okay, these, this is our inclusion criteria, stick to just this, uh, uh, this procedure, right? But what if a patient uh, has a right hem hemicolectomy first, and then within a few days, uh, you know, the colectomy fails and they undergo a reoperation where uh, maybe they've had to have a surgical debridement of the intestines. So when you have a problem like this, what do you do? So always remember that the role of the principal investigator is that you, that they will answer all of your questions, right? And your job is to also admit that, okay, if you don't know something, you don't know something, you need to go and ask the principal investigator. Now the research leader, research supervisor is not the fountainhead of all knowledge, 
you know, uh, you, there are often times that uh, the situation that you're dealing with is, ex- is incredibly complex. And in that case, it is always better to ask, right, and take the help you need. So I think that in my experience, what leaders have to do is to try to take help when they need it and to acknowledge that there are situations where they need help, right? And it could be anything. It could be from protocol compliance to uh, maybe uh, there is some kind of intellectual issue or there's an interpersonal conflict. So in all of these cases, remember that you must always ask for help. Now, managing data itself. Now, managing data is a skill. Um, and I will tell you why I have included this in administration is because data is are the bricks upon with which you build your project. You know, any study requires data, but how do you manage that data? You know, for example, uh, if all of the data is written and collected in this haphazard way, uh, what happens is that you can't analyze it properly. You know, it's very um, it's very important to collect data very, very carefully, right? And so one of the things that I had uh, done um, from my own experience is that I use uh, this stepwise process when I'm managing data. So one person has to be in charge of keeping the data uh, clean, which would mean that, okay, if the data collectors are collecting a lot of evidence, you know, they go through all the patient history, they take, uh, you know, uh, they take down which patient had which procedure, on which day they had these procedures, if they develop surgical site infections or not, and when are we going to do some follow-up. And the point is that all of this has to be represented in a clean, neat way. Now, you can do this in Google Sheets. Of course, you make a nice big Google Sheets uh, uh, document, and in that, you can fill out all of this uh, information. But remember also that you're not just managing the data. You need to manage the privacy of that data. So only you, your research uh, uh, colleagues, and your principal investigator should have access to that data, no one else. And it's up to you to ensure that the data is held securely, right? And also anonymizing data is also very important. It's one of those things that you know is uh, non-negotiable from an ethical perspective. Now, finally, let's go on to managing resources. So managing resources is very simple. Uh, don't waste uh, any funds that are given to you. Um, for example, if you're given funding to cover something specific, like say printing out surveys, uh, always remember that you need to manage and save as much money as you can without compromising the quality of the study. Right? But let's go on to the most interesting part, which is managing people. Now, I'm not sure uh, like uh, if most people understand that managing people is not, you know, you going out there with a whip and you know getting everybody into shape. Uh, that, that's not a good way of managing people. And when you're managing people, remember that you're managing not just a person, but a person at a specific time. And what do I mean by this? Uh, I mean something very specific. Sometimes people are in a bad mood. They will be rude to you. Sometimes they may be just standoffish with you. Maybe they are irritated about something. Maybe sometimes they're just not well. And so uh, they're not responding to your messages or something to that effect. So managing people actually makes the research project successful because ultimately, you know, people are doing the project, not, you know, isolated terms like a resource supervisor or data collector. Data collector is also a person, you know, uh, the principal investigator is also a person at the end of the day. So managing people always comes, uh, remember that one of the, one of my perspectives has always been that when you are managing people for anything, regardless of whether it is a research project or your colleagues uh, at, um, uh, colleagues at work, for example, or, um, you know, even managing your friends, you know, when you're planning something, you need to understand that you have to try to compromise with people, but more importantly, find common ground with them. And I will be discussing this further in the conflict resolution section. So this is essentially my workflow. Um, when I get a resource project that I'm asked to supervise, uh, this is the general idea that I, this is the general workflow that I follow. So my first step is always that, okay, I am going to identify a team. Um, then I'm going to start assigning roles. And then I will organize all the resource documents. And then I'll train the team as well. So remember that like a good leader always needs to train the team. You know, um, many times I've been told this as well as to, uh, many times I've, uh, I've, be, I've been asked this question as to where do we start? You know, what if I have no experience? Well, the point is that if you are part of a research team, the supervisor of the team has to teach you what to do. They need to tell you these are the skills you need to have. Now, I have participated in uh, in f- in five uh, in five or six multi-center trials. So uh, I've concluded two of them last year, and in those two uh, multi-center trials, what we did was that 
The principal investigators from, were from the, U, uh, from the UK and they issued us out a protocol. And my job as a resource supervisor at my department was to just do one. thing. My job was to read the protocol, understand it completely, you know, essentially understand it both forwards and backwards if I needed to. But most importantly, I was meant to ensure that everybody uh, underwent two types of training. So the first hour training was issued by the principal research team, which was they had a small short course that you needed to complete, like a certification course. And once you completed the certification course, you could then start collecting the data. That was like a prerequisite. And then from the uh, from the other side, which was like dealing with the data itself at our hospital, um, that was my job. You know, so for example, I would tell people, okay, this is how you ex uh, this is how you access our patient information system, and this is how you collect the data. Okay, you need to put uh, make sure that you're recording the names of every patient you've recruited, and this is how you're going to anonymize it. And more importantly, uh, one thing that we need to understand is because I am working in Bulgaria, um, all of our uh, patient histories and patient information is in Bulgarian. It's not in English. Uh, it's not in any other language. Now, that is not the case in other countries where English is a major is a major language of uh, use. If it's an important, significant language, and say, for example, in India, most of the research, most of the patient data and patient history is either a combination of English and the local language or it's English and Latin together, right? Now in Bulgaria, it's the it's similar in the sense that most of the information is in Bulgarian, but some things are written in Latin. So one thing that I would also like to uh, like you know emphasize on is that as a doctor and as a medical student, you should try to learn a foreign language, you know, no matter what it is. Um, now, I did see the participant list for today's talk, and I saw that a lot of you are from India, and a lot of you are from Pakistan, um, and uh, some of you are joining us from uh, Georgia and so on and so forth. Um, it is very important that all of you take the time to learn the language that is used in the in the institution that you work at, right? So for Indians and uh, Indians and Pakistanis, I would say, okay, for Indians, it will be uh, Hindi and the major uh, language of your state, right? And of course, English. For Pakistanis, the same thing, you know, it's either Punjabi or Urdu plus English. Uh, for people who are like me, uh, you know, I'm from India, born and raised, um, and I went to school uh, in Northern Bengal in a place called Darjeeling, where mo people mostly spoke Nepalese. And uh, I have lived all across India, like from North, South, East, West. And I personally, I speak around nine languages, right? Now, the degree of fluency, I do speak English, Bulgarian, Russian, and Hindi uh, with uh, full proficiency, but I do speak other dialects as well. Now, why is that important? That is important because the more languages you know, the more likely it is uh, that you are going to be successful, not just at research, but also at becoming a better doctor. And it also opens up career op opportunities for you across the world, right? So it is important that you know languages and you know how to communicate with people and you know how to organize yourself. And you will come up with your own workflow. You know, the workflow is this, this is something that works for me. It's on the screen, but it doesn't necessarily mean it'll have to work for you, but you will have to discover that for yourself, right? Now let's talk about assigning roles. Yeah, when you're assigning somebody a role, you need to take into factors two things, right? So the first is how much they know, what they are, what are they good at, and number two, what they're not good at, right? And so you need to ensure that the role that they are given within the research project, you know, does, you know, it's that you need to ensure that it is not only limited to what they know and what they're good at. You know, when you are a leader of any project, whatever it may be, right? It is your responsibility to also you know, uh, take the responsibility for teaching um, your team members and to help them grow. That is the most important thing I would say as a leader that you need to do. And so in that, with that, with keeping that in mind, whenever you're assigning roles, remember that, okay, some people are perfectly suited for a role. Okay, fine, give it to them. Now, some people may not be a very good fit, but if you are convinced that they can learn, then you can give them roles that, are, that are outside that person's comfort zones as well. Now, many of my colleagues don't really speak Bulgarian very well, uh, they, like, because at the end of the day, Bulgarian is a very hard language, right? Now, that didn't stop me from recruiting them for the study for the simple reason that you can teach somebody their job. You can tell them that this is what you need to do, and I am always available to help translate if need be. I also sometimes, if you are working in a multilingual uh, setting for any reason, uh, please do recruit uh, people who are good at speaking other languages, right? So sometimes you do need somebody who know, who speaks some of the foreign language, maybe they're very well versed in said language. So you need to recruit people like that. So let's go on to the next thing about 
workflow itself. So when I'm organizing a team, uh, one of the most useful things is a WhatsApp group. Put everybody in the WhatsApp group and whoever was interested, right? Make one shared Google Drive folder with all the information in one place. So that should be the study protocol, the uh, case report forms, and like a document that just says, what are you trying to research and why you're trying to research it. And you should do a small literature review in the sense that you can search the latest research related to the topic that you're studying and put it in the chat so that people have an understanding as to what they're going into. Now, the third is very important that I want everybody to have a active email and an orchid ID, right? Now, since we are in this talk together um, and there are 26 or 27 of us, uh, I am going to put the link to orchid in the chat right now as well. You can take your time, but make sure that you have an orchid ID. An orchid ID is like a researcher's ID. Without this, it is next to impossible to conduct any research and also to get attribution for that research, right? So you need to go to Orchid ID and have an Orchid email. And whenever you recruit anybody into a study, or if you and your friends are interested in doing a research project together, you need to ensure that everyone has an Orchid ID and their names, their emails, and their Orchid ID should be stored somewhere safe. So that you know, you know, in administration, it's always important to know who is working with you, who is the member of the, who are the members of your team. So in that case, it is always important to make sure that you have this administrative data with you. And this is more, uh, this is more to do with my own experience as well. Like you should meet your team members at least once every 14 or 15 days. Uh, and that is because see in general research projects take months. Uh, uh, the first multi-center trial that I was a part of took around almost three months for the initial data collection. And then we had another three months just of, uh, you know, uh, doing follow-ups on the patients, ensuring all our data is good. And it is now currently in publication, uh, which means that the manuscript is being prepared, right? So we started last year in February and it is one year now and we are just about to get the manuscript ready. So with most research projects, you need to know that this is not an overnight project. It is not possible. You need to, uh, you know, sort of take into account the fact that this is going to be a time consuming process and schedule meetings accordingly. Now, when you meet with the team members, it does two things. Number one, it ensures that the team member doesn't feel that they're just out in the, like, you know, they are, they are dealing with the project only by themselves. You need to remind the members of the team that you're all part of the same team together. And also that, you know, it also helps you, uh, it also helps you to sort of identify areas of concern that need to be addressed. So for example, if a, a data reviewer is saying that they are not being able to collect data in an appropriate way because the hospital where they're trying to collect the data is not, uh, you know, doesn't have the data that they need, or, you know, the patient histories are sometimes incomplete because somebody has made an error, then you as a research supervisor need, need to take those things into account and make sure you make some changes, right? Now, recruitment ideas. Now, recruitment ideas is, you know, you can recruit people through any way, uh, Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp. Uh, always remember that if you're trying to recruit Person-to-person -person recruitment is better. So if you know your friends, you can try to recruit them and then move, you know, expand your circle that way. The second thing is that, you know, you need to um, use your skills. So everybody's skilled at something. You know, you may be good at graphic design. Maybe some of you are good at um, writing. Some of you may be good at uh, just speaking to people, right? So all of these things need to come together uh, so that you can, uh, you know, make a successful uh, research project. Now, I am good at designing websites um, uh, in the sense that I have some understanding of HTML and programming and stuff like that. So whatever, what I do is that every time we have a major project, the first thing I do is to read up the protocol. Then I identify some people who I know will be interested in the project. And then the third thing is that I make a website. And in the website, you can see all of the information about the project, right? And so one way that we can do that, like right now, is to take a look at the website itself. And this is the website I designed. Right, it's very simple in the sense that this is Cascade Study Plevin, which is conducted by which department? The national lead was uh, Dr. Karamalia. And this is all the information that you need to have, the study protocol, what is the study about, and then how you can join. Now, in this area, I had just written my contact information and uh, a small FAQ section. The same thing as you can see here, you need to have an I ORCID ID, you need to go through the uh, certification course. And what is the process? Like, so, you know, how do you do the, individual data collection. Now, this part is very, <clears throat> is very specific to each hospital. And at the end of the, uh, I had also put out some schedules so that everybody has access to the same information as I do. 
and a, and my contact details. So what this did was that I didn't have to keep messaging people who had questions and like you know keep responding to the same types of questions again and again. Um, I could just send them this link and they could just access everything here. They had and if they had any specific questions, they could come to me then, right? And so this made the the process very efficient. And I supervise, I think at uh, yeah, I supervise around thirty to thirty five students. We recruited uh, 70 patients through a four month period. And uh, we were also responsible. This was at the time, the largest uh, research team in our institute uh, with student involvement. So that is something I'm very proud of because all of my colleagues who participated with me in this study, you know, made sure that this was a success from start to finish. So going back to the, to the talk as well, Let's talk about perspective, right? So now you have sort of taken a group together and I am a very big fan of these polls. So we are going to do another poll. And this one is to ensure one important part um, of my talk, which is the, the importance of perspective. So I want all of you to look at this picture on the left. This uh, piece of art is called uh, The Girl of the Pearl, Pearl Earring. It's by Johannes Vermeer. It's one of my favorite pieces of art, by the way. And what I want you to do is to go to the link that I've just put in the chat right now and try to describe the colors that you see. Uh, limit yourself to two or three colors only, right? And we will wait for your responses. And you can still see the screen, you can see the picture and just give me the top three colors that you see um, on the screen. I'm going to separate this here. Yeah. All right, you're getting some good, good answers. Yeah, this is just uh, around about 30 seconds or so, and then we'll get on. Okay, now that's enough. So now let's take a look at the results we've got. Now each of these results, are, like the way this thing works is that it's based on the number of responses I have. and if multiple people answer the same um, uh, in the same way, that will be the largest uh, word on the screen. So for example, most people saw blue and they saw yellow, but there are some people who saw gray, golden, uh, silver, somebody saw skin color, white, black, so on and so forth, right? So what is the purpose of this? Yeah, people are still trying to fill out some questions. Okay, that's great, but I'm gonna close this for now. Um, and let's see. Why did I put this picture? It's to illustrate the fact that there are differences in perspective. What looks like yellow to somebody will look like golden to someone else, right? Somebody could see this and look at uh, and say that this is brown. You know, somebody could see that that's not white, that's gray. You know, that could be a, a different shade of white, whatever. Now, perspective is very important for the simple reason that when there is a research group, you will always have differences, not just of opinion, but differences of perspective as well. So for example, you and three other friends are deciding to do a research project. Uh, you know, you're embarking on this exciting journey. And two of you say that you want to do a literature review, two of you want to do a systematic review. Now, the difference between a literature review and a systematic review is that a systematic review is far more rigorous. A systematic review is essentially the highest form of evidence alongside the meta-analysis. Now, what does that mean? Uh, if you have very high ambition, good, go for it. But you know you have to also understand that you have to work with the team you have, not the team you want. Yes, of course. Like for example, if it was up to me, I would love to have uh, the Nobel Prize for uh, Physiology and Medicine working with me on a research project. But that doesn't. That's not likely going to happen. I have to work with the people I have, and you have to also understand that people perceive things in ways that are very different to yours. So when you have a difference in perspective, right? How do you stop that from becoming a bone of contention that you know, threatens the entire existence of your research project. So the best way to do that is through cons conflict resolution. Now, conflict resolution. Now I'll talk to you about con conflict resolution because I have spent 
a lot of time in uh, both as a debater, I've also worked as a negotiator uh, for different uh, forms. And many times, you know, the problem with, con with conflicts is that a conflict arises because, not because, you know, two sides begin with the idea of just harming the other person. Uh, two sides begin with a disagreement on a cert certain point, right? Now, for example, I say that I see in that picture blue. Somebody says this, somebody says they see dark blue, right? Now, the point is, what is common between those two points of view? What is most common is that, yeah, both of us agree it's blue. We just, maybe we disagree on the shade of blue, right? That is the same point when you come to conflicts. And conflicts are very, very common in research projects. And the reason for that is very simple. You may not always agree on the same point as other people in the project. And especially when it comes to things like intellectual endeavors, one of the most important things is that, okay, when I am looking at a certain study or a scientific research uh, results from some other place that contradicts my own, I need to include it within my assessment, right? So I can reduce bias. And of course, you're going to have conflicts sometimes between the principal investigator and the reviewers. So these are the three things that you need to follow. First, listen to what the other side is saying, then you should speak. Second is, of course, be professional. And third is look for common ground and then go from there. So there are three aspects to any, any problem. There are pros, cons, common ground, right? So you need to take these three, three things into account. Now, an example where this works is when you do a statistical test, right? And you come up with one conclusion and the second reviewer comes up with a totally different conclusion. How do you solve this, right? The only way you can solve this is by rerunning the numbers ask the statistician to look at it or ask the third reviewer. Now, usually the third reviewer acts like a vote. And in that case, they can sway it from one side to the other. But it's always important to know that you have to prove it to the other side that, yeah, okay, this is why they are wrong. This is why one side is right. Or there is a middle way, right? Now, if you have any experience with statistics, and it's okay if you don't, but if you do have any experience with statistics, always remember that there are different statistical tests to run. And I will cover that on a later talk. But you have to always understand that just because an expert is saying that there is something wrong or there is, or they perceive things in a certain way, doesn't necessarily mean that that is that conclusion that an expert has drawn is correct. Yeah, on the balance of likelihood, yeah, most likely an expert is correct, but there are times when they are wrong too. And so there is this very common fallacy that we use in uh, moral argumentation and in debate as well, called the, the fallacy of the expert or an appeal to authority. Now the appeal to authority is very unhelpful because what ends, what does happen is that you know the you take an argument, whatever it is, and you say the world's leading experts believe in said thing, uh, whatever it could be. It's, uh, it could be that okay, using uh, a valsartan is the best uh, first line uh, angiotensin receptor blocker for hypertension, right? Now maybe all the experts agree on this, right? But just the experts' words are not enough. And so the reason why we say that, okay, we should uh, use Valsartan as a fir first line ARB is not because a bunch of experts came together and said it, it's because a bunch of experts did multiple studies and then they came to, to this, uh, to this uh, you know, to, to this statement or conclusion. And to an extent, when you have a conflict, even in your own research project, just because the PI is saying one thing doesn't necessarily mean that they are, their word is, you know, is everything. You need to re-verify and try to see whether what they are saying has value or not. But remember that you always have to be professional. You have to look for common ground between your point of view and someone else's point of view as well. So now with the last, this is the last section of the talk and uh, we are going to talk about what medical research actually does. So medical research actually, you know, it builds bridges between people, right? So it builds bridges between disciplines, builds bridges between countries builds bridges between the levels of expertise. So where you have a student being in touch with an expert of a certain area, it builds bridges between the known and the unknown, right? And it also, of course, builds bridges between people. Now, why is this so important for us today? It's important for us today for two reasons. Number one, the world is a very fractured place, as is very clear by uh, you know, what is happening in, in Ukraine right now. And it's not just Ukraine, there are, the, there are entire sections of the planet completely embroiled in conflict, right? And remember that as doctors and as medical professionals, our primary duty is not to some flag. It is not to 
some ideological system. It's always to help out our patients, no matter where they are. But the point here is that supposing there's a person who's from an Indian medical system, uh, who has studied in India and worked in India, they don't know how the Bulgarian healthcare system works, right? So how should we build this bridge? The best way to build this bridge is by being part of the same research team. And the same research team, uh, the point is that when you're a part of a research team, you're all oriented towards the same goal, which is to improve the available evidence so that you can better help your patients. There is no space here for, you know, petty divisions like, you know, what nation you come from, what your race is or whatever, right? These are not things that, uh, that are important. It doesn't matter where my researchers come from, as long as we are working on this research project together. And that is a point that I feel like needs to be repeated again and again, primarily because um, every, time, uh, every time there is a war or there is some kind of disagreement between people, um, sometimes scientific research is the only bridge we have with people on the other side of the fence. So when COVID uh, broke out throughout the world and turned itself into a pandemic, you know, people from China, Russia, Ukraine, India, everywhere, we collaborated together uh, so that we could fight COVID together, so that we could serve patients around the world. Now, of course, there's a lot of criticism to that as well, that yes, uh, you know, there was some geopolitical uh, mishap, some diplomacy or whatever, but existing relationships between scientific researchers from all of these countries, you know, helped us have a proper, you know, initial response to COVID in the sense that we could sequence the genome immediately, we could immediately start working on vaccines, you could immediately start working on public health policies, you know, if a country didn't have enough oxygen cylinders, we could send it to them. If they didn't have ventilators, we could send it. And that is the entire purpose of medical research. Medical research seeks to improve the world, right? And we have to sort of give up this idea of constant division. And I want everybody here to sort of understand this. And I'll say this from my own perspective, because I have worked with researchers from India, from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Ukraine, Russia, Greece, Italy, Bulgaria, of course, uh, Nigeria, uh, Ethiopia as well, and from the United Kingdom. These are people from all different, from different continents of the world, right? They are from different countries, they're from different time zones, they're from different cities. But all of us work together simply because we discovered or we agreed that medical research is the goal that we, that all of us have in common first. Now, most of the people I have worked with, you know, some of them uh, their first language was Russian, or their first language was Ukrainian. Some of them were older than me, some of them were younger than me. Um, some of them, uh, you know, many of my research colleagues have always been a few years ahead of me in research, right? So they have been, when I was in second year, uh, they, were, they had just graduated as doctors or they were PhDs. But you have to understand as well that in this case, you know, I learned from all of those people throughout that, throughout this journey in medicine. Even currently at Bulgaria, I work with a lot of people who are from the UK, who are from Pakistan, or from India, who are from Bulgaria itself. Some people are from North Macedonia, some are from Serbia or wherever else, right? And why is that important? It's important because, you know, your nation doesn't matter, your religion doesn't matter, your political ideology doesn't matter because all of you are working towards a goal that transcends all of it. You know, it's a goal that is that aims to, you know, protect your patient or to give to your patients the best you can. Is the most egalitarian thing. But I will also admit, of course, that this is hard. It, it's not always easy, right? It's very easy to say that, okay, yeah, no, you know, we know we should have sanctions against Russian scientists. Uh, when I when the war first started last year, um, there, I had come across, a, I was asked to sign a petition where they said that we will not cooperate with any Russian scientists and we will not do any research projects with Russian scientists, for example. Now, I refuse to sign something like that for the simple reason that while I do agree that what is happening with Russia and Ukraine is wrong. Uh, wars are not justifiable in any way, shape or form. They cause misery to generations of people. And I've seen it firsthand, unfortunately for me. Um, I also don't believe that you can just start punishing people based on their nationality. You know, that is a form of discrimination that I do not at all agree with. And I've had the same, uh, uh, same petition a few uh, months ago, where I was given, where, and I will not name the organization, but uh, I was told that, okay, there should be no scientific cooperation between um, members of the European Union and members of uh, the global South, because such a cooperation 
um, sort of solidifies the idea of the brain drain. So once you go past the nonsense of what was said, because it was nonsense, it was based entirely on this idea that European scientists should work only with European scientists and uh, scientists from the global south should only work with other scientists from the global south, that is, you know, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria, India, so that the Indian scientists have a chance to work on an equal term with European scientists, right? Now, when you look at it that in, in a with more clarity, you will realize that there's nothing more than just a way to divide people, even in the scientific community. Now, that is something I do not support and I will not support it either. And neither should you. The, the point also is that when you are working with people from other countries and other systems, you have as much to learn from them as they have to learn from you. And then, and it is, it sounds very romantic to say this, but there is far more in common between two medical students, right? No matter where they come from, all of you are suffering through the same thing. Most of us don't sleep at night. Most of us have spent our early twenties, just studying all day and mugging all night, more or less, you know, like medicine is hard enough as it is. We don't have to add, you know, complexities of geopolitics into this. And primarily also, it is also unethical. Now, when I am a leader as well of many of these research groups, I have had the privilege of working with people from all across the world. And that has made me not just a better doctor, but also a better person because I have, you know, now I have friends from all across the world. And that is important. And that is important also because, you know, sometimes you need a perspective from a system that is very, very different from yours. And that is important for the success of not just a research project, but your own success as a person and as a doctor in this global world. So a good analogy I like is also this. Uh, it's leadership in medicine is you leading a team up a mountain, right? This is the mountain of the unknown and you have to climb it up. And there are lots of challenges, you know, time, resources, motivation, and these are all normal. But when you have a team, remember that the team is, is this whole, it's a cohesive structure. One person in, in the team may be the leader, but the leader does not exist in a vacuum. The leader exists with the rest of the team. So I would like all of you to also, you know, take this into consideration when you lead your own research teams, that you have to treat every member with respect and with dignity, of course, and to recognize the strengths and weaknesses in everybody so that you can help them grow. Now, I have worked in research teams uh, as a very junior member and then climbed up through the ranks. Um, and I was very lucky that I had very good mentors from across the world, uh, some of whom are very close friends of mine uh, now, many years later. But I was given the best I could ask for in terms of leadership. So I would like to take this opportunity to try to tell you what one of my mentors said about the qualities of a good leader. And this is not, this is not mine entirely, but this is from my own mentors. And the two most important things are patience and resilience. You have to be patient with the process of research. You, know, you can't do research overnight. Sometimes you'll have setbacks. Sometimes your hypothesis, you've spent six months on testing a hypothesis and you realize the hypothesis is nonsense or it doesn't work or it's not feasible. Sometimes you want to do this really brilliant study. You have this really brilliant idea, but you don't have the resources to carry it through. What do you do in those cases? You should not let frustration get to you, right? You have to be able to, you have to be very resilient through these changes. And uh, the third is, of course, the ability to nurture members of the team. You know, you have to ask yourself at the end of your leadership, was everybody around you um, happier at the end of your leadership that yes, we learned quite a lot under this person's leadership <clears throat> and have they grown? So if they have grown professionally, that is a success on you as well, because you have led them through it, right? And of course, you need to be calm in the face of crises. And this is something very important to surgical research as well, because many times in surgery uh, in, as well, we are dealing with emergency cases, we deal with uh, really complex cases. And sometimes it's not, uh, the patients that we see are not easy to deal with. Um, they have more, multiple comorbidities, you know, they may be just be sicker, sometimes, you know, they are just weaker. So you have to be calm in those types of crises, right? The leader must always be calm, you know? And always remember that you need to make sure that your team stays motivated. So you have to remind them of the task at hand. Why are you doing this project? We are doing this project so that we get published. We are doing this project so that we, you know, help society in general. We are doing this project so that all of us have publications together. And, you know, 
your reasons for motivation, the motivations for why you are doing a research project is entirely your own and your team's, right? Maybe you're doing it because you want to help the, a very specific subset of the population who are your patients. But you have to remind them that this is why you're doing it, right? Because it's very easy to lose motivation and then not be able to, you know, gain it again. You know, uh, academia in general uh, is sometimes it's very intellectually and cognitively demanding. And because of this, um, what happens is that sometimes researchers get demotivated as well. So it is important for the research leader to motivate your team, to remind them that, yes, the work that they're doing is important. The work that you are doing has some meaning and that you are with your team members, no matter the time, date, or no matter the situation, right? So with this, I'm going to come to an end to this talk. Uh, my, I want to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Martin Karamalia, who is my mentor and has been my mentor for a couple of years now. Um, and many of these inputs uh, that you see today about uh, leadership and uh, resilience have come from him. And uh, of course, uh, I have learned quite a lot from Dr. Karamalia and from our rector, Professor Dimitrov as well. And um, remember that research and leadership are always something that you learn. In my opinion, it was always that. So when I was younger as well, I had a commanding officer. I had a prefect who was in charge. I had somebody else who was, you know, above me in the hierarchical leadership structure. But when it came to my time as well, I was also, you know, um, I was also in some ways someone else's leader, right? And so leadership and these skills are, are a set of skills that are, are often passed down from one generation to the next, you know, or one cohort of uh, students or one cohort of doctors to the next, right? And it is always good to have a good mentor because that is invaluable no matter what you do. Uh, a good mentor is, uh, is essential to your growth as a doctor currently, right? So finally, I want to thank all of you for your patient listening. And now you guys can ask me questions. I'm going to just uh, stop the screen sharing. Uh, yeah, I'm now going to stop the screen sharing. And if you have any questions, please do let me know. Thank you very much for the insightful presentation. I'm sure that this has given us all more insight into the practical aspects of leading a research project in a team and how to overcome conflicts. Um, now I'll go through the questions that were submitted in the form. Yeah. So the first question we have is research needs a person to be good at social interactions to get, to get the required information. How can I build up confidence to face people? Okay. So, um, I am going to put a disc like a qualifier to that, uh, to my answer. So I'm not a therapist and I'm not a psychotherapist either. I'm not very good at, uh, telling you the steps you need to take with issues with your confidence. But what you must understand uh, is that you don't always need very good social interaction skills to be a researcher. Uh, it depends largely on the kind of research project you're doing. Now, if you need to interview people uh, to gain data, so that is, a, that is something called uh, interpretative phenomenological analysis, uh, where you ask questions to your subjects. You know, it's used a lot in psychiatric and psychological research in uh, oncology, uh, like uh, in quality of life assessments in oncology and things like that. Now, there is a reason why you may have low confidence, right? Um, it could be because your professors are not like helping you uh, gain any confidence. It could be a lot of different things. So you need to examine those and only a therapist will be able to help you with that. But two things I would say uh, that helped me, like, uh, because I'm not saying that I don't have problems with, uh, like I don't have issues with confidence or issues with anxiety, everybody does. Um, whenever you're doing any research project, you need to be almost delusional in your ability to, um, in your belief in yourself, right? Now, this is a lesson I learned a very long time ago. Um, I am one of those people who has uh, done a vast variety of different things. You have to believe in yourself, no matter. Look, if you let somebody else doubt you, then okay, you know, you're letting someone else doubt you, but don't doubt yourself. You have to keep repeating to yourself that you can do it, you can do it, you can do it till you are convinced that you can. Sometimes it's as simple as that. The second thing about confidence building measures is like, you know, for example, if you have social anxiety that you are not able to talk to people, uh, you are an introvert, that's fine. Maybe try to do a, do a role in a research project where you don't have to talk to people so much, right? And remember that people are just like you. You know, there is a very high statistical likelihood that if you are shy about talking to someone, the other person is as well. 
And number two, you also have to remember that like most people don't remember conversations, right? The only person who's beating yourself up for like embarrassing yourself 10 years ago is you. No one else remembers, right? So if you want to really build up your confidence, remember, take it one step at a time, I would say. Um, you know, try to just, just try to talk to people first and do seek the help of a, do speak the help, uh, do seek the help of a therapist. I think it would be helpful if you think you have uh, like a social anxiety related problem. And yeah, I, I hope that helps. Like, uh, yeah, I hope that helps. That would be my answer for now. Thank you. Our next question is the differences between primary and secondary author and role of mentors and credits given to each role according to the scientific community. Okay, I know I like this question very much. So whoever has asked it, good job. Um, so I believe in dismantling hierarchies all the time, you know, in, in some ways, in, in, in a certain part of history, I would have probably been considered an anarchist and thrown to jail. But let's discuss hierarchies in medicine in general. So when you look at a research a paper, you see the list of authors. So the first author is the person who has supposedly written this. So under the, so you have this uh, series of guidelines called the ICMJ guidelines, the International Consortium of Medical Journals. You know, they have their guidelines for authorship. So the first thing they say is that the person who has contributed the most to the research project and who has actually written the paper should come first and then the second, third, fourth, and fifth, so on and so forth. Now, realistically, hmm, so realistically, I would say this. What does end up happening is that the junior most member of the team, whoever's like, you know, the medical student, first year, second year, whatever, um, is uh, has actually written the paper, but the senior most member of the team takes full credit and becomes the first author, right? And the last author would be the first author's boss. So for example, consider if I am, uh, say, a resident in surgery and I'm writing a paper, but I have asked a third year student to do the actual writing bit, you know, correcting all the grammar and everything. Um, what will end up happening is that when I do submit the paper for submission, my immediate boss, whoever is the head of my department or the head of my research unit, they will be given the last author's credit. I will write my own name first. My second name will be my, uh, my colleague, Bob, who is probably like the second resident. And then the person, the student who's actually written the most of the work and does, does, and has done the majority of the work is either the third or fourth or fifth or sixth or 10th author. Now this has happened to me as well. It happens to everyone. Um, there are sometimes, for example, I've written the entirety of a paper from start to finish, including doing the literature review and everything, but I am the second author or the third author or maybe the fifth author. It, now, the point with that is that you, there is nothing you can do about it, right? Now, I am older now and I have more experience. So when I get, you know, requests for, oh, can you help us write a paper? Then I'd say quite clearly that if I'm going to write a, the paper, I want appropriate authorship. Uh, if you want me to write your paper, then it's first author. That's the ICMJ's rules. Or at the most, the second author. Not this that, you know, you take advantage of my own, my ability to write and you also take advantage of the fact that I am not entirely, uh, you know, able to negotiate my way, which is what happens to a lot of medical students. And then you forcibly, you know, relegate me to some corner of the authorship list while you take full credit. Now, unfortunately, in medicine, that happens quite a lot, right? But when you look at, in general, have two rules of thumb. When you look at a research paper, the guy who's at the very last, the person at the very last is likely the head of the laboratory or a PhD supervisor or whatever. The first person has always done the most of the work. That means, um, you know, coming up with the idea of the paper, coming up with the experimental design or the protocol, whatever. And the second person usually is the person who has done the second most amount of work. So maybe they are the ones who edited and rewritten some things and added more information or whatever. The third author is usually uh, like somebody who's in the middle has made some contributions. So it could be that, okay, they um, they created all the tables, they put all the statistical analyses and things like that. That would be the third one. And fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh authors are like your guest or honorary authors. You know, um, a lot of uh, research work nowadays is, uh, how do I put it without sounding absolutely rude? Uh, a lot of uh, research work nowadays is uh, nepotism to an extent, you know, so I write a paper and then I invite one of my friends to be the co-author because, you know, he and I wrote a paper last year and, you know, it's a form of I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Now I'm completely against it because it has nothing to do with scientific validity and more of it is politics, but you should remember that, yeah, like if you're going to write a paper and do the majority of the heavy work, have the confidence to say, yes, you will, that you want the first or second authorship if you're doing most of the work. Um, if you don't get it, withdraw yourself from the paper, I would say that, because 
um, you can't be expected to do work that is disproportionate to the credit you're getting. It's unfair, right? I have dropped out of many research projects for this exact reason, that I would do all the writing work and all the background work and spend hours and hours and hours of my time doing this. And then at the end of the day, get the third authorship or fourth or fifth or you know, relegated somewhere in the, like, in the second line for doing a majority of the work. If I was doing a little bit of work, fine. But so nowadays, I don't, I don't like this exploitative method. It happens quite a lot in India and Pakistan, especially. Like I, I have friends who study there. But I would be foolish to say that it doesn't happen in other countries. It happens everywhere. So it's a, it's, a very, it's a very bad part of our scientific culture. Remember that try to stick to the ICMJ's guidelines. I think I'll write this in the chat as well so you guys can read it later. Um, it's called the ICMJ authorship guidelines. Uh, you can search for it and it'll come, up, uh, in, it'll come up in your Google results and you can search it there and find out. Remember that if you are complying with anything, always use the ICMJ authorship guideline and make sure that you put your foot down. It doesn't matter if you're a first year student, second year student, whatever. Don't let anybody bully you, that's it. Thank you. And uh, meanwhile, we are going through the questions. Um, I've posted the feedback form in the chat. Uh, you need to fill it in order to get that attendance, uh, certificate of attendance, and uh, it will also help us to improve our events. And the next question is, what would be the best type of research to start with and how I, should I manage it with studies? Okay, like what's, uh, we're on a roll with the, with the challenging questions this evening. So I say that you can start whenever you feel that you're ready, right? Uh, so I started when I was in second year, but then uh, to be very honest with everybody, and this is in full view of all my colleagues who are in sixth year as well. So I spent most of my first and second years in, uh, in college, you know, doing what most college guys do, you know, um, not really studying, having way too much fun and yeah. But I did have the time. I made my I made sure I had time to do my research work as well because I was interested. Now, for most people, I would say um, if you're in your third and fourth years, uh, then you know you're doing a lot of clinical work. You know, you're going to the hospital. Uh, you are like actually studying the core parts of what makes a good doctor. You know, pharmacology, clinical medicine, cardiology, surgery, whatever. Uh, this way, this time is a good time for you to make contacts with people who are working, you know, the residents in your hospital, other assistant staff, teaching staff. And it's always good to talk to them and ask them about research because at this stage, what happens is that the, the average resident or scientist or whatever working at a department knows, okay, this is a third year student. They know, for example, what the basic anatomy of uh, a research project likely is. They also have some level of subject knowledge. So you're not going to be, you, you won't be responsible for teaching everything to this guy. Uh, so from third year, fourth year onwards is good. But if you want, you can begin in the first or second year as well. Uh, normally, look, if you're in the first year and the second year, you should try to do a literature review in public health and a case report. In third and fourth year, try to do a case report and a literature review, something like that. And another thing that you can do is also to write letters to the editor. But the problem with getting with publishing letters to the editor is that Letters to the editor are not considered uh, peer reviewed because it's just a letter or a response to a uh, to the editor talking about some very important issue. So an example would be one that I wrote. It was called uh, uh, Four COVID nineteen Ds to Learn and to remind to remember for monkeypox." So some lesson that we learned from COVID nineteen, we are now using. We should remember when you are approaching monkeypox. But then I wrote that uh, last year. That's like after five years of you know experience in public health research and things like that. So. Try, look at the different types of research projects there are, which you will find on, not just on my side, but on the GCMER's uh, uh, catalog of uh, meetings they've done over the last year. You will see that there is a wide variety of different types of research projects you can do and take part in them. But one more thing that I would say, just, just before I uh, like lose track of the whole thing, is that look, there, is a, there are surgical um, steering groups called like Star Surge and Eurosurge. So the, they, uh, every year they have one major multi-center trial in which they want people to be recruited. So go to their websites and take a look at the study protocols and then talk to a doctor at your department and see if they are willing to enact this. And that is one way to be part of the research project. Uh, and what happens with that is that, okay, so for example, at, uh, it, with, with my research teams, I always only uh, try to take up two hours of their time every week. Anything more than that, people are not going to be able to give. And uh, I want high amounts of efficiency, not volume of people so i try to say 
you should dedicate two to three hours for actual research work, which is like data collection and stuff like that. And you can have any amount, like say maybe four or five hours every week just to do background research or reading or uh, what have you. And for writing, uh, once a week, like one hour, once a week, at least for academic writing, you should dedicate that. That's, uh, uh, that's what I would say. Thank you. And the next question is, please talk about finding mentors in research journey. Mm, okay, so finding mentors is, uh, is largely subjective. So, uh, you know, uh, look, uh, you, uh, there is no way to predict how to find a good mentor, right? There is like, there's no, uh, a mentor is a very subjective thing in the sense that a mentor can be good for you, but not good for someone else, right? And the avenues where you find mentors are always the same, you know, go to your hospital or your university, and see the professors who are most interested in teaching students and ask them if they know somebody or if they can help guide you. That's the best way to find mentors. Thank you. And the last question is how to write an experimental research article. Okay. Um, an experimental research article always, remember, always begins with the problem statement, right? Then after that, you go into writing a study protocol and then the study protocol has to be very specific because the study protocol has three parts. So the first part is your literature review that you establish why you are, why this particular experimental study is good. Second is choose the type of experimental research you're going to do. So are you doing like comparative laboratory analysis or, you know, are you doing spectroscopic analysis or what, like whatever your research method is. Then the second part has to be dedicated entire, entirely to the specific laboratory or experimental research design that you've chosen and why, right? And then the third part is um, your assumption or rather your um, justification for doing that project and combining it with the specific research design and where you think the, the problem lies. So why are you doing it? It's not that, okay, yeah, like I'm doing it because I'm interested in it, but you have to justify, okay, yeah, like this many people have this type of cancer. That is why I'm trying to understand this specific type of laboratory study. And it also needs to include the kind of, uh, the kind of materials you will need. So that means anything, if you're going to do, uh, uh, if you're going to do uh, experiments on mice, for example, then you need to check the type of genotype of mice you're going to use, uh, the type of reagents you need, uh, whether you need funding or not, whether there is existing funding that you would like to take part of, uh, whether you need imaging, what are the specialists you need to do the work. So your entire experimental research protocol has to begin first with this ma massive protocol. And then you have to take it to the, your PhD supervisor usually. Now, this is why I, this is why students actually generally can't do experimental research uh, without appropriate support is because a lot of this requires materials and uh, statistical materials, lab, lab materials, biochemistry, things like that, which uh, is very difficult and very expensive to get. Now, if you were in Germany, for example, in Germany, they have an integrated MBA PhD program. So in that case, yes, you get specific funding just to do this project, but in other places, that's not the case. So experimental research comes entirely from, from, uh, from this uh, process. Thank you. And we have one question uh, that was asked in the chat. Yeah. Should we have a specific training or certification before we go into a research project? No, uh, it depends. So in some, pro in some projects, they will give you a certification that you need that is essential to starting the project uh, in whatever role you are in, right? Now, in general, as a general rule, you don't really need a certificate. Like, so for example, there are these courses on research methodology, but those are all like any meaningful one is a master's degree course anyways. Uh, but the Indian Council of Medical Research has a very good uh, biostatistics and research methodologies course. It's free. It's available on YouTube. You should go through that. Uh, the second one is that, you know, if you are interested in things like Coursera, for example, Coursera has very good uh, lectures on research methodology and research protocol design or research design, especially for medicine. So those are very good ways to get started. If you want to just learn the various types of research projects you can do, and also the various types of like research methods that exist. The third thing is uh, that when you want specific training for something, uh, usually in a research project, if we are doing a research project, supposing if I'm doing a research project today, that is entirely my own design. Um, so one of my design, one of the research projects that I hopefully will be doing by the end of this year is um, bowel perfusion studies using a thermal uh, imaging camera, right? So 
the, what I would do in that situation is number one, I would have to teach people what ball perfusion is, why we do bar perfusion tests, right? So ball perfusion is actually, you use this uh, when you're making an osmosis, right? And the second thing that I would like to teach everybody would be how to operate a camera like this. Now that is entirely my job. You know, I'm not going to be able to find somebody who's a thermal camera operator, like a, normally a thermal camera operator who specifically operates a thermal camera likely works for uh, NATO. Okay, it's impossible to hire people like that. So you have to train people on how to use a proper thermal camera and uh, train them in the basic principles of the kind of imaging I need. Then the bulk perfusion st uh, study itself, uh, I would have to probably take them to the surgical department, show them what we mean by bulk perfusion, what the different stages, what existing designs there are for assessing this. So all of that would be entirely on me. I would have to design the entire training module so that you know people of the project know what, what is going on. Um, if you want to, in general, just like start research in general, and you want to know what you want to study, uh, the best thing is uh, go to the ICMR's website. That's number one. Number two, at your university, you may have a statistics and biostatistics department. It's always very helpful to go and speak to them. Uh, they sometimes, like as in my experience, uh, sometimes they, depending on the number of people they have willing to sign up, uh, they can do like a short course on like immediate medical statistics, like the most important statistical test uh, that you should do. And uh, speak to somebody who's doing a PhD. Uh, so usually PhDs uh, have like as part of the PhD program, they have compulsory training in you know, medical statistics, and, uh, like in statistics and research methodology. So if you know somebody who has a PhD uh, in even in engineering, medicine, uh, economics, uh, you can ask them to teach you because some of these statistical tests are common throughout. Uh, they, they don't, they don't, they're they not only limited to medicine. And of course, uh, as an area of specialization, research methodology is a very important and up and coming area of specialization as well, where your job is only to be a medical uh, methodologist. Uh, you will just, uh, you can suggest different study designs to the surgeons if they want to examine something. So that is an area of specialization if you can do as well if you want to. So I hope that answers the question as well. Thank you very much, and um, we look uh, forward to seeing everyone in the in our next event on the review of surgical audits, uh, which takes place at the end of March. And yes, thank you very much on behalf of GCNUR and everybody here. Um, about GCMER Bulgaria recruiting, I would like to remind everyone that we have two positions available membership in charge and PR head. And I'll send the link in the chat. So only um, people from Bulgaria can apply. And you can check the presentation um, in the link I've sent a while ago. And if you all agree, we could take a picture, yeah. photograph. Uh, please turn on. As long as everyone's awake. <laughs> I hope so. Let's wait a few seconds. Um, Eli, you'll have to do it from your end because my computer is bugging, bugging out absolutely. Yeah, I'll take the photograph. Yeah. Okay, well. I think we can take a picture yeah. and smile. Okay, thank you everyone. Yes, thank you Mick for coming. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, all right. So I'm going to now end the meeting. I think uh, is yeah, all the links are in the chat. Everything is ready. Okay, all right. Thank you, uh, thank you everybody for coming as well, and thank you Allah for having me, and uh, have a good evening.